Hi, welcome to the Abu Group, Abu, a book of one's own, and welcome to our Friday lunchtime learning session. And I hope you've all had a great week. I hope you've all got wonderful weekends planned. Um, and this will be the perfect ending to your week because today we have a fantastic lunchtime learning guest. We have the wonderful Dr. Lisa Turner. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Lucy. It's great to be here. Great to have you. And so Lisa, uh, Lisa is the founder of Set Freedom, which is a spiritual and consciousness awakening organization specializing in training professional coaches and practitioners in her signature process, which is conscious emotional transformation, CET, and that is the set. So not set in the usual um, spelling or so. Um, and uh, Lisa is also the author of a book that has just come out called Set, C-E-T, Yourself Free. So this is all very fascinating stuff. And actually, uh, Lisa, you have an extraordinary story to tell about how this came about. So would you like to fill us in, give us a, a, um, something about your journey, which is really incredible in itself? Absolutely, yes. And this, this, it was interesting. I didn't used to talk about my, my past very much because I didn't really think it was relevant because I had essentially recovered from it. So my story is, and I'll, I'll keep it, um, I'll keep the, the sort of details of it to a minimum, but essentially I was groomed and then trafficked by what I later found out was in fact part of a whole paedophile ring uh, and and um, so I was uh, by, so it started out when I met my music teacher when I was 12 and when I was 15 he had moved me to from Australia to the UK and I was kept essentially as a house prisoner for five years so I wasn't allowed to do anything without his permission so I couldn't leave the house I couldn't speak to anyone um he controlled everything so what I the food I ate the, you know whether I watched tv I mean you know, or, you know what I watched where I went who I spoke to everything I did eventually manage to escape and at that point I had I mean I, I think it's, it's really weird at the time I just thought it was probably not a great relationship you know and uh it wasn't until a lot longer, a lot, you know, quite a while afterwards that I started to realize this was really quite a dysfunctional relationship, to say the least. So then I started, I realized that, you know, I wasn't um, responding emotionally in the way that was appropriate. Is that perhaps that if you want to, you know, um, in some of my other books, in my book, I do explain a little bit more about, about that. Um, but essentially, I had what would be described now as PTSD, social anxiety um, disorder. And, uh, and a whole bunch of, you know, depression and a whole bunch of other labels that you could put on it. So I tried all sorts of therapies. I tried psychodrama, psychotherapy, um, went to see psychologists. I also tried counseling and coaching. And so, you know, many of the kind of more mainstream things. <clears throat> I also tried uh, things sort of a bit more of the esoteric. So I tried some of the Western mystery stuff and, you know, the Indian healing and, and things like Reiki and EFT and shamanic healing and quantum healing and theta healing and all things like that. Wow. And what I found was that some of these things worked. Some of these things didn't. <laughs> some of these things seemed to make it worse. Some of these things worked and then the effect wore off. And I had always loved science and I had uh, trained as an engineer. In fact, my, the, the doctor part of my title is I have a PhD in aeroacoustics and mathematical modeling. So that's Goodness. noisy fans to you and me. <laughs> so that sums around noisy fans, very, very specialism and not, not, very, not particularly interesting. Uh, they are used on the uh, Rolls-Royce engine, if you are interested in that, though, on the, the big jets, the, the A380. <laughs> You're right, goodness so, <laughs> eclectic woman you are. That, that tiny little piece of model is used in the aircraft industry. So, um, but what I did was I kind of thought, well, some of this stuff works, some of this stuff doesn't, and I just refuse to believe that emotions and our emotional response was random. And I thought there must be some logic to this. And so what I did was I essentially applied 
my same scientific thinking and I used essentially an empirical model which is you know empirical is like you do this you get this and you're not too worried about like why you get this it was like you do this you get this you do that you don't get this and so I just looked at well we do this we get that so so and this led me to developing the the set process so in essentially what set does is it pretty much does what it says on the tin so conscious emotional transformation it transforms your emotions that the, or the emotions that you're conscious of and what it does is it releases the cause of painful emotions from the past and that and and i want to be really clear like all emotions are useful. This isn't about getting rid of negative emotions because that's one of the things I found actually quite damaging. Right. And, uh, well, there's this whole, like in the new age and in the self-help industries about positive thinking and just stay positive and just say your little affirmations and it'll all be just fine. And, and not only do affirmations just not work and like we can go into the theory of that if, if, if anyone's interested, but, um, but actually what that then does is people start to get afraid of feeling negative emotions. And there are two causes, not two types of negative emotions. There are two causes of negative emotions. One is negative emotions in the present. And I think of, I actually think of all emotions when they're as a result of something that's happening in the present, a little bit like when, a little bit like that game you played. Do you ever play that game where somebody's hidden something? My brother used to play this with me. He would hide something in the, in the, in the room and then you had to play warmer, colder as yeah. you see, walk around the room warmer warmer colder 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 and you just so your emotions are there to tell you warmer positive emotion moving towards what you want colder negative emotion are moving away from what you want so you know it's like disappointment is a really you know it's a classic one it's like oh you didn't get what you wanted even guilt like we're a tribal we're you know we're a tribal species we're, we're designed to live in groups and we, we function best in groups when we all support each other. And guilt is actually a really interesting emotion that's there to tell us, oh, this isn't going to be work. This isn't going to work for the whole group. So, so it just kind of tells us, like, kind of keeps us all in check. So we behave reasonably, we behave nicely to each other, lets us know when we're moving towards what we want and away from what we don't want. So all emotions are useful. But when we experience a negative emotion in the present now as a result of something that's happened in the past i call that trauma in fact that's kind of a, one of the more technical def definitions of trauma so trauma is any time you have an ex any time that you've had an event in the past which still affects you now after the event in a way that limits and restricts you Yes. Yeah. So and, and most people have trauma to some extent. Some yeah, people have a have lot of live a very extraordinarily perfect life not to have been mildly traumatized by something in your past, wouldn't you? I think so. And I actually and it's, what was really interesting is um, I actually had a client once who had had what she described as the perfect childhood like like her parents had protected her from anything anything bad ever happening and um and it's a little bit like that black there's a black mirror episode which is almost really um sort of um illustrates that um and and as a result she could not cope with anything where anyone if anyone was angry around her she would freak out because she wow. had no coping no strategy for, uh, for basically like, well, okay, there's, a, there's no way of having a boundary around that. Or like she'd never learned people get angry and it's okay. Yeah. You know what? People get angry and sometimes nobody dies. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So just um, going back to guilt, Debbie says here, religion utilizes guilt. So that's very interesting. Absolutely. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so um, I mean, uh, we could have a long conversation. That'd be a, what I call a four beer conversation <laughs> yeah. about religion and 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 how it's been used to as an attempt to um, enable people to actually behave reasonably well. Um, but yeah. it's got a little bit distorted now. So, as I say, that's one of that's a four beer conversation, and perhaps for another day. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. So, so, so going back to your client, how did you, how did you, how did you deal with her? 
Ah, oh, well, what we what we did was um, we actually created uh, strategies and um, we installed new processes. So if we have this idea that um, your nervous system will have an input of an experience, and then the idea is the input leads to some kind of a, uh, some kind of emotion, leads to some kind of behavior, like internal process. And then out of that is the, the external behavior as a result of that. And we call, I call this the emotional response cycle. And what we do is we just adapted her emotional response cycle so that the input caused a different thought. So, so the thought that she was having was somebody's angry, like I'm going to die, something terrible is going to happen. So she was having actually an emotional response to almost not having trauma, which had kind of caused her a, a, a traumatic response. So essentially we used Gosh. set to re to rebuild and uh, repair her neurology so that she could be around people who are angry and she could either say around me that's not okay boundaries that you know <laughs> or just not be around that person and still be okay or to go okay maybe this person's got a point what do I need to do to change my behavior so I don't make this person angry so so, right. so she essentially it gives her choice it gives her yeah. choice yes how fantastic yes so um, one of the things that might be useful for people to do now is to take, because I have a little scorecard and it's a way of um, uh, assessing whether or not you have trauma and what your, it's, um, it's the emotional resilience score. So if you head over to emotionalresiliencescore.com, in fact, I'm going to see if I can Brilliant. share that and do that. I'm just getting this sorted so maybe you yes, should I think i've got that i think debbie might be going to put that in that. the comments so if you can see that so emotional resilience score.com if you head over there that should take you Fantastic. to our scorecard and if you do that and then we can have then you can you know um we can have sort of gives you a sense of uh like um what's going on for you and we can have more of a conversation about that yeah absolutely yes no that's that's so, fascinating so um debbie's asking does your brief questionnaire help to give the initial outline to how a person reacts in certain situations and would you say it's a good opener to one of your sessions um she said i did it the other day and it was interesting so. absolutely absolutely and possibly um there's a couple of places you can go after the scorecard uh one is you can um just we have a um gives you a free month in our set free program which is the online sort of self self um study process of set um the other um and the other thing you can also get a free copy of the book and then from there we'll send you um some emails if you're interested about how you can join the wait list for our um some more of the the smaller groups so it is definitely a great opener it just gives you a sense of like where are you because emotional resilience is do you have a mechanism for responding to what's going on so the the thing about trauma is trauma stops you succeeding it's right it stops you being doing and having what you want to be do and have or the other way i've said so if you have if you have trauma and even a small amount of trauma can cause you to be sick broke and sad <laughs> And I know that sounds a bit extreme, but if you look at some of the the um, the the signs that you have trauma, so things like obsessing over the past, you know, when you relive those conversations, even if they're years afterwards, uh, any time of any kind of either controlling behavior or people pleasing. So it's kind of these extremes, catastrophizing um uh things like excessive planning where you're overly rigid in your thinking, right. if you're indecisive brain fog. Uh, anytime you've got low energy, because one of the things about negative emotions and trauma takes energy to have trauma and then it takes energy to keep it kind of managed. So a lot of people manage their trauma well, but it still impacts them and often it impacts yeah. them in our in our health. And I've worked with lots of people who've had uh, things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. For legal reasons, I have to do my disclaimer that I, I make no claims that we can cure or heal any physical ailments, although SET does seem to re reduce the symptoms. That's all we can say. <laughs> so and it's no um, replacement for, for uh, seeing your seeing a medical practitioner. <laughs> No, no, no. Of course, legal not. Disclaimer we, we, done there. Yes, absolutely. Understand all, I can all that, is, but but very interesting that reducing the trauma reduces a whole load of um, you know physical sort of um, 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 presentations of it. I suppose. Yeah, and the the, the theory I work on is that um, that 
it takes energy to have trauma then it takes energy to manage it and then you yeah. know you maybe you've heard of this you know the idea of only having so many spoons and you know people who have got some kind of illness or or even you know whether it's mental illness or emotional um, emotional trauma they have fewer spoons that so a spoon is you heard of this theory of spoons so the theory of spoons is like you have five spoons and if you use a spoon for something like going and doing the shopping then you have because for some people that uses a spoon and and then you have less spoons to do other things. So if you have five spoons a day, you can only do so much. Right. Now that's, I've, ne- I've never heard that. that I mean, I've heard theory, of it, the theory of spoons. Spoon yeah. before. That's completely new to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, so what um, so the idea is that some people just have fewer spoons. And right. the reason is because they're already using these spoons. I mean, they're just like bundles of energy. Yeah. To, to basically to hold the trauma and then to manage it. And what we find is with set is that when you've cleared that resistance, cleared the blocks, cleared the trauma, you no longer have to manage it. So you just have more energy. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Fantastic. So you're able to do much more, have more energy, be more, um, be more proactive in the world. Absolutely. One of the things we we find is that um, because I want to be really clear, set doesn't stop you feeling negative emotions. It just stops you feeling negative emotions that are caused in the past. Yeah. Caused by events from the past. And and what that means is when you feel a negative emotion now, you then know, ah, what is it I need to pay attention to? So sometimes you might find yourself, I don't know, getting anxious and then you'd go, okay, so what's causing this anxiety? Oh, hang on. I haven't paid my bills. I forgot about that credit card bill. And and then it's like, so then it's like now there's an action you can take to 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 just resolve that. And then you don't need to do all this sort of managing of emotions. So one of the things I think can be useful is to to help people to understand how set is different to other emotional release and therapeutic processes. So would it be so would it be would it help if I explain that? Do you think? Yes, absolutely. That would be fascinating. Okay. So I work on this principle that, um, and this is where it's sort of, um, so I'll, do, I'll just explain it and then you can decide whether it's controversial or unusual. So, uh, so it's, it's actually quite a unique premise. So we work on this, what we call the five principles of love. And the first principle, which is probably the most important, which is there is only one emotional energy and it's love. Then we have the idea that everything is energy and then the third one is that you are an infinite, you're, you have an infinite energetic self. So the idea is that there's only one emotion and it's love. Love should flow freely and infinitely throughout your body, your, your energy body. And when it doesn't, we have this, the fourth principle, which is resistance to love is what causes the pain. Ooh, right. OK. And then we have and then the fifth one is love seeks to grow and expand. So if we have this idea that we're infinite beings, everything we experience should be just love flowing through us and emotions are just there to guide us towards more of what we want, more love, less of what we don't want, less love. But what happens is if we have a resistance in our nervous system, we feel that resistance as and, and then it becomes labeled a negative emotion. So if I kind of explain, so, 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 so anger is the, is the fear, the label that we call the emotion when you feel or think or experience that something happened to you, that somebody did something to you that was unloving. So then sadness is the feeling you feel when you've lost something that you love. Fear is the feeling you feel when you think you will lose something that you love. Hurt or re- hurt and rejection go really uh, sort of hand in hand. They're the feeling when you what you try and give love and it's bounced back. Ooh, right. Yeah? Yeah. And then um, and then uh, guilt is when you uh, when you think you didn't love enough. So anyone who's a mother or or been involved with children, you know that guilt will will surface. I always think when you when you have when you first have I've just I've actually just become a grandmother and it's quite quite interesting because my daughter was like, I had no idea I feel so guilty about everything. And it's like, yeah, you just got the mother's handbook installed in your neurology and it's just like every page says, you'll feel guilty. You'll feel guilty. Yeah. You'll feel guilty. (laughs) 
<laughs> because so how, I mean, yes, I mean, how, how come? How is that a good thing for being a, for parenting? Why why do we have these negative emotions about our children? Well, uh, I, I mean, it helps to some extent, but I mean, it's sort of you know usually more than you need, really. <laughs> well, I think it's more than we need because we have trauma from the past. Oh, I see. Of course, yeah. it all ties up. Yeah, yeah, Lisa, yeah. thanks. Yes, and, and when you have it in the but it, it but you know particularly with babies because it's like it's actually the survival of the species it's like you want to stop the baby crying and yeah. you feel guilty if you if the baby is still crying yeah. and it's like that actually that it's, you know it's actually brilliant at ensuring the survival of the species so just in the moment that's okay yeah if the baby's crying and you feel guilty that it like, is undeniable you are gonna go <laughs> and sort that baby out <laughs> yeah so, so that's my that's my theory of um, of emotion. So there's only one emotion, and and it's love, and that what we feel is resistance to love. So right. what I'm going to do now is to explain how set works and how it works differently to many of the other approaches. Great. So there are there are two main um, ways of of categorizing kind of healing and therapeutic modalities. And I, I label those as either psychological, psycho, or um, uh, and then um, spiritual or kind of energetic. So and that's where the psycho spiritual um, aspect of set comes in because it combines both. So if I share my little screen here and hopefully this works. There we go. So the idea is that, and by the way, these are very fancy graphics and I, I will I will expect a round of applause because I have clearly <laughs> mastered PowerPoint animation. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. They look great. They do the job. <laughs> and, and sometimes they do things like, oh, I didn't expect it to do that. But <laughs> in which case, we'll just have a little laugh because that's OK. So so the idea is that love should flow freely and infinitely throughout your entire being. So let's see. There it goes. There's the animation. Wow. Right. That's impressive. fantastic. <laughs> now, if you have some kind of a resistance. So the idea is what happens here is love energy tries to flow, but it hits the resistance. And then what you have on the other side is less love and your nervous system or your neurology is designed to experience or feel the difference. So when you have that difference, and this is caused by an this is this is caused by trauma in the past. So so that's essentially what you're feeling when you have memories from the past, which cause you to feel a negative emotion. Now, that's where you've got that resistance. So when now uh, that's the, the OK, right. So let's go. here. So this is where the psycho spiritual piece comes in. So psychological, this refers to things like. Uh, things like NLP, timeline therapy, hypnosis, psychotherapy, psychiatry, I bundle in here as well, coaching and counseling. Mm -hmm. Then you'd have more of the spiritual or energetic healing. So things like EFT, that's the tapping, yep. healing, Reiki, quantum, shamanic healing and spiritual healing where you kind of where somebody sort of channels some kind of healing energy. So this is my theory of how these two work. So first we'll look at spiritual or energy healing. So what happens is. The, you have this block or resistance. You've got high energy on one side, low on the other. And by the way, it's not just the low that feels bad and the high that feels good. It's the difference that feels bad. So what the um, spiritual healing does or energy healing is it fills up where the energy is missing. Sometimes it also drains off and, and sort of balances where it's, where, it's in, where it's excessive. But the block is still there. Right. So right. what happens is you go and have your Reiki session, you feel better. Then a month, a week, a month, a couple of months later, you realize the problem's come. It hasn't actually come back because it never went away. But what's happened is over time, energy has tried to run along that path. And so the imbalance is built up again. So it absolutely does work to some extent. Then this is how the sort of psychological, neurological methods work. So what happens is with those is, the block or resistance is kind of removed or understood. So then what happens is it doesn't necessarily rebalance the energy. Now, um, and often what happens is it requires a lot of conscious efforting. It's like now you understand why you've got the problem. So you're going to find some workarounds and you've got a story and you've got, a, you've got a, maybe a process and a strategy, but you have to remember to use it. And 
it doesn't, because it doesn't necessarily rebalance the energy. For some people, the energy does start to flow, but just having that kind of compacted energy upstream, if you like, and this and the depleted energy downstream, it almost causes those pathways to, to become, it's like a path that you don't walk along very much. So, you know, it's, um, it, you know, if you don't walk along a path, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you know, kind of hack your way through with a machete is kind of the, you know, walking through the jungle kind of um, um, sort of analogy. Yeah. So it does work. It gives you a lot of understanding of your problem and you can, you know, you really, you know, this is how the sort of analysis works, but the problem is, you know, the, the imbalance can still be there. Then we have this third one, which is where we have um, a lot of, a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of mechanisms that are used are essentially coping strategies. And what that does is that just aims to bypass the problem. And this is where, um, you know, we have to just avoid the triggers and avoid situations where we're going to be triggered or, you know, I can do it, but only if I, you know, stand on one leg and say my affirmations three times and, and, you know, my prayer and like rub my lucky beads and things. Now this, so first of all, anytime you're avoiding triggers, your world will shrink. Your world will just shrink because if there's a whole bunch of stuff you can't do, even if you wanted to do it, you can't do it because you've got to avoid the triggers. Your world is going to shrink. There's also just been some new research out, which actually demonstrates that uh, avoiding triggers just, it just never clears the problem. It, it just, it almost cements it in the neurology. So what SET does is, you won't be surprised to know it does both. So what it does is it removes the block or repairs the pathway. Then it floods the neurology with, an, with a really high vibrational energy. And so that everywhere and anywhere there's resistance to love, love can now flow. So it is wow. as if, this is the really paradoxical and quite surprising thing about set is, it's as if the problem was never there goodness and 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 almost from a therapy a therapy you know therapist's perspective <laughs> it can be quite uh, there's a little challenge there because you'll have clients that come back and go well I was always fine and it's like that's right you were <laughs> do you, do, I mean do people actually forget the trauma I mean does it go so far as to kind of wipe it off your memory banks well you remember the event yeah you don't remember the pain and the best right. way i think of it if you um so i'm just going to stop sharing a bit like that. childbirth i was actually going to say that exact thing oh exactly. sorry sorry <laughs> <laughs> no 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 my tele my telepathy is working so well done lucy <laughs> it is exactly like childbirth and most people remember childbirth as being this amazing beautiful experience and they don't remember the pain and that's actually how the past is supposed to work and there's in the book there's a key piece that enables that, which I'll ex which I explain in the book. And if you figure out what it is, post it on any of my social medias, and I'll let you know if you've got it, if you've spotted it. But there's a key piece that lets you that that absolute sort of it's the golden prize of set that enables us to let go of the pain of the past while still holding that having the memory, and it actually turns your memories into something beautiful and exquisite. And this is where, where I, I'll come back to my experience, because sometimes people go like, surely, you know, you were raped on a daily basis. Surely that must affect you. And it's like, well, actually, and this is, you know, I, I, the, I don't even have the need to forgive him to, because to forgive him would suggest that I don't love myself, that I feel damaged in some way. There's something there's need, that we yeah. need to forgive. Yeah, I understand that. And, and I actually, it's like, I would never have come up with set. I would never have come up with this process and the exquisite beauty and clarity and power of set if I hadn't have gone through that. Like, I know this is part of my purpose. I know that I was meant to be an engineer who did the science, who figured this stuff out, who solved this problem. And, you know, like if I, you know, it's like when we've experienced set, you know, you feel lighter, you've, you're more resourceful, you're more empowered, you're more present, you're more loving, you're kinder, but you're also more boundaried, more, you know, you're able to take risks, but you're also able to think clearer and make rational choices. And, you know, when I look at the world and if we look at the whole world, and this is where I get a little bit um, 
uh, I, I, well, I hope not too grandiose, but it's like when we look at the world and we look at, you know, we've got climate change, we've got ecological challenges. One of the biggest challenges that is on the horizon, which no one is talking about, is the energy crisis. And I'm not talking about the bills. I'm talking about we're a 19 terabyte by, uh, terawatt planet. And at some point we're going to run out of the minerals to produce even... Yeah. The minerals to produce, anyway, there's going to be an energy crisis. So I'm going to do all that. I was nearly switched on my engineering brain. Stop it, Lisa. <laughs> um, so like when we look at the world, like, you know, we've got misogyny, we've got racism, we've got inequality, we've got people starving, we've got people, you know, there's like, if everyone felt fundamentally okay in themselves, like fundamentally okay, without feeling grandiose, without feeling unsafe, I believe that we'd have the the solution to things like racism things like inequality things like um, not just you know not just mental health issues in the workplace not just you yeah. know people not living their best life and not living you know their purpose we would have a better world i really believe that and yeah that makes that makes perfect sense so so um lisa I mean, I guess, you know, we kind of know what talking therapies do. We can imagine it. We may have experienced it. We kind of, you know, some, some people will know what, you know, Reiki does, what happens when you go into a, a room with a Reiki practitioner. What exactly do you do um, in terms what what is set in terms of its application? You know, I'm <laughs> the glad you are. Of it. I'm glad you are. So. Uh, so what I do and what I train my um, certified set practitioners to do is a, a whole sort of, the, the, you know, it's a quite a nicely simple structured process. So the first thing we do is we assist the client to bring the problem into their awareness. Because one of the, like, set sounds amazing, but one of the things it can't do is it can't release what you're not conscious of. Sometimes right. you're quite, sometimes, I mean, sometimes people are conscious of it and that's relatively easy. Sometimes people just know they've got a problem, but they don't know what the cause is. So we ain't, we assist the client to bring that into their awareness. And how do you thing. actually do that? I mean, for example, if something happened to you when you were a baby and, you know, we, do, we don't remember much of our babyhood, how do you bring that forward into consciousness? Well, what we do, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a really interesting question because this is where, it's actually not what happened that's the problem. Right. The event is not the problem. Uh -huh. What is the problem is what you is the, how that event was installed in your neurology yeah. as a blog. right. So, and this is where it's completely different because I I don't care whether your daddy loved you enough. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously I do, but it's like that's actually not the problem because you know we have lots of, there are lots of people going around highly functional really happy and you know it's like they know their dad didn't love them or and i'm just using that as an example yes. because they didn't make that mean i'm not lovable because the problem isn't daddy didn't love me the problem is what did you make that mean yeah and so the next so the, a lot of the um the process is we do some questioning and it's very structured questioning and um, we give you know we give people um a, a, a journaling process and we're just looking for the triggers. Then we ask a whole bunch of questions that are very structured, very precise. But is that a cat next to you? <laughs> oh, no, it's a dog, actually. Oh, okay. I could just see a tail. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we ask some very structured questions that are very precise to find not what happened. It's not the event. It's not, you know, like whether you, you know, whatever happened, it's what you made it mean that's the problem and then yeah. what we do is once we've got that we basically just clear it and release it and it's a combination of what sounds like a guided meditation but a whole bunch of energy work is going on in the at the same time to clear the problem as the so what the so when you get to the actual set release process the client is invited to bring it into their awareness and oh but only as long as we uh, just to give us a long enough to clear it because we can only clear what the client is aware of so right we into awareness so that awareness and we release it almost instantaneously and this is very different to a lot of therapies where yeah. you have to um where you have to talk about it and really understand it and really and it's like no, no we don't really need that um it's like i mean you can if you want but it'll just put the rates up you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> just why don't we just clear it um and the other one is you know a lot of therapies are all about you know like venting your anger and shouting and ranting and actually all that does is is it 
um, it kind of reinforces the anger pathways in the neurology. And what we want to do is actually deplete those anger pathways and rebuild where the where the emotion is is um, is missing and create new pathways. So a lot of what SET does is um, the final stage of SET is so we bring it into awareness, we clear it, we find the um, we find the the uh, the what I think of as it's like the missing piece that had that distorted meaning installed in it. And it, we explain this all in the book, probably even better than I that I'm doing now. Yeah, absolutely. Read the book. Yes. Yeah. And the, and the <laughs> I'll final, put the link in later. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And then the final piece that we do is we actually create new pathways. So we flood the nervous system with energy, create new pathways so that you have even more energy. So essentially uh -huh. it might look and sound like you know as you said you know what happens in a reiki session you know what happens in an analysis talking cure and set is because it's psycho spiritual it actually has a little bit of both so we do some talking and we do some energy work and clearing wow so did i did i explain that at all well lucy yes not? yes uh yes you did i mean i have a um uh, a clearer idea um of what it is i mean how how do you do the energy work is it possible to be any more specific or or is it just you have to be in the room to understand it yeah so this so the how we do the energy work so this is where it gets a little bit esoteric and my engineering brain will go well that sounds very strange and odd <laughs> and all i can say is try it you'll probably yeah. find it works um, in fact, there's a lot of research to suggest that anyone that has a really um, strong sense of a spirit, like a spiritual connection or spiritual energy, they actually have way fewer mental health issues than those who don't. So, you know, really? take from that. That's just what the Gosh. research says. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. So Susan says, um, and it is permanent as well as instantaneous. That's absolutely. Yes. Now, I will give a little caveat this to this because so, it sounds amazing. Uh, but there are some things it can't do. So first of all, it can't result, it can't release emotions that are a as a result of ongoing situations and circumstances. So for example, had a client, amazing clearing, and then she said the emotions have come back. And the challenge she was having was she was in, she's actually in quite an abusive relationship. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what to do with your life. But are these emotions here to tell you that you maybe need to make some changes in your life, like possibly leave this abusive relationship? And she was like, yes. <laughs> so if you're, st so th and that's where you've cleared the past and now you're in the present. So it can only clear from the past. Right, right. So if you go on putting yourself in the path of trauma, it, you can't clear that because obviously it's ongoing. Yeah. And it's also it's like the, the purpose of emotions are to tell you you're moving away from what you want. And, and you know, to, like negative emotions tell you you're moving away from what you want. She wants to be out of that relationship. So she's going to continue to feel negative emotions when she's in that relationship. Yeah. It can't release what you're not conscious of, which is why we have to bring it into our, our awareness. It can't release what you're not willing to let go of. And that's part of the sort of the. the that's an interesting one, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And there's a whole piece here. It's like there's some stuff around secondary gain and things like that. But again, the 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 the, the practice practitioners are trained in ways to negate that. So it's not that we make the client want to let go of it. We find, well, it must be serving a purpose. Let's find another way of getting that result without feeling the trauma. Right. The other right. thing it set doesn't do is it doesn't give you superpowers or make you levitate. <laughs> <laughs> no shame <laughs> i know i know <laughs> if only no that no no that that is that is absolutely fascinating so so you are do you treat individuals or do you train um set coaches or do you do both so i i, I so yeah the answer is yes so i have a um a, um uh, i do group work i very rarely take one to one um clients now just because i just don't have time and they'd be all, i mean there's a waiting list a mile long for people that's like when i when i've got space i'll you know I'll, I, I can work with a one-to-one -one client yeah um unless it's a really interesting case if you can give me something really interesting i'll go <laughs> whoa i want to work with that like if you've got a like a real like a real juicy bipolar paranoid schizophrenic it's like oh that's, that's an interesting model of the world <laughs> maybe maybe um but mostly so i work with um uh, in small groups so we get a, you get a lot of interaction and um attention from me to really find that root cause because that's where the the skill is uh, and the other thing i do is i train people to be set practitioners 
And what I do is I, um, I always ask people to do the small group program first before they train because it's just way easier to train someone who's already gone through the set process and had a really thorough, powerful, in-depth clearing. They know what it does for themselves. And then, then, then it's just like, also, once you're clear, we can get rid of all those limiting beliefs around, I can't learn and this is hard and I'm not clever enough. <laughs> Right, right. And in fact, do you need do you need to be clear yourself in order to be a practitioner and be able to clear other people? Well, I would certainly say so. Um, I mean, like any, you know, if you look at uh, the um, uh, sort of uh, psychologists, they are required to be in in therapy when they're treating their clients so we have a yes, similar process. Yes. so we're um just about to open our association of set practitioners where we're going right. to set that up so that we have an ongoing way of supporting our practitioners so um so the route that many people come through is they they take our set cert level one which is called reset yourself so you work on yourself and that there's a there's a small group program there then they move on to the set certification where they learn to work with clients and then they can move into the association where we can um, help them to grow their practice and business. Right, right. So um, Debbie said here, you need to clone yourself, Lisa Turner. And Susan has said, Debbie, that's what her certification process does. Correct. Correct. I'm signing up for her next group to get started for certification. So that's brilliant, Susan. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> How exciting. Oh, well, um, Lisa, thank you so much for um, being with us today. I think you've um, you've really um, been inspiring and, and, and fascinating. It's so um, such an interest. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, for a lot of us, that that kind of link between the, the psychological and the spiritual is is um, something that we've kind of, you know, been on the lookout for, really, possibly tried, worked with, looked at both and not found that either is quite the full answer. So I think this will be really, really fascinating. And I do absolutely recommend that you read Lisa's book. And um, we've put all the links in the threads, um, in the comments um, about where to contact you, Lisa. And yes, um, absolutely. And uh, so thank you so much for your time today. And um, uh, hope to um, see you again soon. Thank you, thank Lisa you Turner. So much, Lucy. Thank you.